Welcome to the Faded Spade Podcast with your hosts, Tom Wheaton and Sean McCormick. Happy New Year. Welcome back to the Faded Spade Podcast. We were on an elongated holiday break. The poker boss, Sean McCormick, the co-host with the most, and myself, Tom Wheaton, founder and CEO of Faded Spade. We are rested, we are recharged, and we are back with an awesome next season of the Faded Spade podcast. Sean, how the hell was your break, man? I'm exhausted. <laughs> I'm tired. I'm overworked. No, I'm just kidding. I just uh, said no. we're refreshed. What's going on here? <laughs> no, uh, the holiday break was great. Um, actually had a, a blast uh, on Christmas and uh, spending time with Mrs. and stuff like that. Obviously, my wife being a teacher, she has like almost two and a half weeks off or something crazy. I don't know what teachers get these days. Uh, obviously, they all well deserve it. And, uh, you know, sometimes those breaks need to be even longer. But uh, yeah, straight into the new year. And uh, had a New Year's party at the house. It was the first time we did it at our house. Um, wife just told everybody, come in your, like, PJs or whatever. And we played board games and uh, card games and charades all night long until, uh, until midnight. And then, uh, you know, it was like it was like 1201 hit. Everybody's like, all right, I got to get the hell out. <laughs> so that was New Year's Eve. So here's a funny thing. My <clears throat> wife decided to do that at our house with our neighborhood, but on New Year's Day. Everyone shows up on their PJ in their PJs with some kind of dish. The kids run around. I don't know. It started at like ten. Next thing I know, it was like five thirty. It was just like, oh boy, <laughs> that's a long day. But good man, glad you had an awesome New Year's, man. I did too. And I'll tell you what, we are not short on updates in the poker industry. But first, excited about our next guest. I felt like we had a great first season, and we're starting off strong. The Faded Spade podcast, you guys know the untold business and career stories of our industry's best and brightest, and we are bringing on the president of Poker Central, Poker Go, Sam Simmons. Um, it's going to be a great interview filled with like awesome career advice and his journey and his career and where Poker Central and Poker Go is going, so that's coming up in a couple minutes. Um, but man, Sean, the year starts, it's 2020, we've got the GPI awards in full effect, really cool. Fans can vote on a bunch of categories. You know, we've got Greg Raymer winning the all-time five-time record-breaking of HPT Championship, which is just phenomenal way for him to start and HPT to start. You got Phil Galfon, who's been on the Faded Spade podcast, and I do some work with, who has lost his damn mind. Just kidding. Who knows exactly what he's doing with the Galfon challenges, starting to stream heads up. PLO challenges with a variety of people on run at once poker, you know, go check that out. If you haven't yet, that's going to be some exciting content and some really great poker strategy, poker entertainment. So kudos to Phil Galfon, the entire run at once poker team. You have so many cool things going on in the industry right now. And it's just the mid to end of January. Yeah. How about that, man? Three. We three into January and there's already so much going on, but uh, yeah, you gave a nod obviously to uh, the GPI awards and uh, that's coming up. Uh, I believe it's March 6th. Don't quote me on that. That sounds right. Um, and uh, it's always an amazing day uh, for players, industry people, media, poker media people, content people, vloggers, bloggers, the list goes on and on. Um, it's a it's a pretty exciting night to come together and recognize um, the great year. Uh, this time we'll be celebrating what every the accomplishments made in 2019. Um, so it's it's just a very cool night. Uh, it's kind of like our Oscars, I guess, or our Grammys, or something like that. And uh, you know, not only is it nice to uh, get everybody in one place and get to talk and share ideas and celebrate these people. But it's also nice to see poker players not wearing sweatpants <laughs> and t-shirts. Although someone will show Helmuth, up. Helmuth, last year in a t-shirt. Someone will show up. <laughs> yes, Helmuth. I can't knock Helmuth. It says Aria. What do you want me to do? It's the branding. It's the personal branding. I agree, man. And hey, held at the Poker Go studio. Live streamed yes, on Poker Go. So I think that's a great transition. So many wonderful things going on in the industry, but we're not going to hold up the podcast any longer. 
Uh, we're going to get going. This is the untold career interview of President Poker Go, Poker Central, Sam Simmons. All right, everybody, welcome back to the Faded Spade podcast. My name is Tom Wheaton, founder and CEO of Faded Spade, with our co host, Sean McCormick, the poker boss, and a very special guest to kick off 2020, the second season of the Faded Spade podcast. We have the president of Poker Central. As you guys know, the business behind Poker Go. We're here to talk about his unbelievable career journey, a little bit about his past that maybe you guys don't know. Sam Simmons, thanks for joining the Faded Spade podcast. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Very happy to be here. And like, look at this, a fresh new mustache, apparently, to start off the new year, just for That's us, That's right. right. <laughs> new, new year, new me, rolling into the 2020 with a bang. So was this like, you know, the November month extended to, to Mustache March? How does that work? Yeah, it's become basically a, uh, a six months on, six months off type of thing, quite literally. We, uh, we had a no-shave no November going, and then we're, we're going to let it roll into Mustache March and get a running start into it. Dude, there are a few people that can pull it off, but you pull it off, so well done, man. Uh, you, you flatter me, but I'll, I'll take it where I can get it. <laughs> yeah. And then Sean, like you shaved the beard. What's going on here? Like you're like, this is four or five days stubble. I'm used to the big old beard. What's going on? You actually should have seen it um, about seven days ago when I just was just randomly staring in the mirror one day and I was like, I haven't seen my face in like five years. I don't even know what it looks like. Shaved it all off, immediately regretted it, went into work. <laughs> Every all the jokes happened, of course, at work. Everybody talked about how I look like a child and I look 15 years younger, which I guess I'll take to some extent. But you know, it was a, yeah, it was totally a whim. I didn't lose a bet or anything. Everybody's like, "How much was the bet for?" You know, and uh, no, I just decided, uh, you know, I haven't seen it in so long. Let's check it out. And I can tell you this for sure: I've tried the mustache once. It does not work for me. But Sam, you're pulling it off. <laughs> oh, I appreciate that. Well, we're not and you're gonna... looking very youthful, lad. Yeah, look at that. The young buck. We're not going to talk about uh, we're not going to talk about hair when it comes to me. We're just going to go ahead and skip over that, and we're going to get into this. So, Sam, you know the the purpose of the Faded Spade podcast, right? You know, yes, we're a card company. Yes, we're a growing poker business. But this is all about sharing kind of the untold career stories of influencers and players and and business leaders in our industry, right? Because yeah. we don't think that gets shared enough. And there's so many great entrepreneurs, so many great passionate career people. So many great players that start their own businesses and, and players like yourselves who also now run companies and are growing within the corporate world. So this is about that story, man. And I just want to start off, for those who are watching or listening, tell us a little bit about yourself, man. What are your roots? Where are you from? And kind of how'd you get in this whole game? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, this, not only in, in terms of the business, but myself, it's kind of just been a, a long, strange trip uh, over the past couple decades and especially the last decade business-wise. But originally from San Diego, uh, grew up and went to school out there. And then I, uh, shortly after college, moved out here, which is, I'm in Vegas today, actually to do real estate. Um, which is at, which, which at the time was also bizarre because my, uh, my major in college was accounting. So I went from being an accounting guy based around the track to be one of one of the big four firms, hated it and ended up pivoting to sort of the finance real estate type of thing. And then went about that for about six months and then ended up coming upon the poker central business. And, uh, at that point in time, it was a, if some may recall, it was actually a 24 seven network. The business model was such that. It was designed to be basically the golf channel for poker, 24-7 uh, feed on the major distributors like DirecTV, uh, Cox, and the like. And we ended up pivoting about three and a half years ago now into what is today Poker Go, which as many know is the uh, subscription VOD service that streams 100 plus events per year across WSOP. And then of course the events we do at ARIA, Super High Roller Bowl, Poker Masters, US Poker Open, Poker After Dark, and then some World Poker Tour stuff on there as well. Love it, man. And, you know, as a businessman in the industry and as a fan, like what Poker Go has done and I think will continue to do for poker entertainment, I think is revolutionary. It's, it's an evolution. So I know we'll get a lot into that. Um, and I'm not just saying that because you guys use Faded Spade cards for a lot of your programming. I'm saying <laughs> that because I mean it. It is not nice a plug. plug. Well, we had Helmuth on and he was like, promote, promote, promote. And, you know, you're going to listen to book. somebody. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, all right. So, so take us back. So, University of San Diego. That's right. 
so there oh sean just put it away so university <laughs> of, <laughs> university of San, san diego so were you introduced to poker there was poker a part of your life at all personally before you kind of got into it from a business standpoint poker in my life's been around for it, it was well before college in fact um this is this is for this podcast only but you know i played a little online in in the early days uh growing up uh whether or not that i should have been but you know I, i experienced the game at an early age not only by participating in it both uh in some games online free and otherwise um some family games at home and of course watching it on tv uh in my part of my upbringing was during the poker boom i remember vividly watching the chris moneymaker wsops and of course most of the most of the high stakes pros out there got into poker uh, with that being their first exposure. And of course they were of age at the time or at least 18 where they could participate actively. And I wasn't there yet. So uh, I just, I, I, my, the extent of my action or activity in poker was more as a consumer, as a viewer, which I think really gives me sort of my, uh, my advantage in, in the business today. And uh, to an extent, the current climate of poker is always what I've known. Uh, post Black Friday, so to speak, and that's that's kind of been my uh, I guess my my past in the game. Right on. So when you were graduating, and I think you mentioned finance and accounting, right? What was it was, like- it was yeah it was accounting accounting through and through, but it was sort of a financial pivot towards the end. So what were like when you were coming out of college and you were just starting your career, like you know I was marketing and I remember having these goals of oh I want to be the marketing manager of a entertainment yeah. company or whatever like what was your what were some of your goals coming out of college there weren't many and I think that just that in of itself is very telling at the time looking back uh, it was just one of those things where you graduate and you got to do something and I I knew it was going to be business I I had a propensity for accounting at the time I've just always been very math driven and then my uncle is uh, he he uh, used to work at a, at a Deloitte and then PwC. He gave me some good feedback and we, I was kind of just would work with him on, on sort of mapping out my trajectory with one of those organizations. And it wasn't until I guess it was my junior, maybe even early senior year. And I don't know if either of you guys had been in sort of that accounting type world, but the you live and die by the big four firms and you mm. to an extent have to sell your soul in college to get a place in one of those in one mm. of those organizations and once you sell your soul then the real fun begins with slaving away for several years just mm. to get to a point where you start to gain some critical mass in your in your career and you're basically forced upon a certain track and i was i started to your point thinking about my goals and thinking ahead and i was finding that that track didn't align with in the abstract what my goals were to be uh, mm-hmm. a decade two decades down the road so that's when just i was i was so late in in college at that point that uh it wasn't a spot where i was going to change majors but it was that pivot where I, i picked up a few of the real estate finance related classes just to refine my skill set later in school and then took those with me uh post graduation into real estate that's cool man um i've got some friends who who did that path where they went to like eny and you're right like that was their life for yeah. years and then they were like i got to get out because what the courage you had to do after college they didn't necessarily have the courage to do they knew it in their mind but they didn't necessarily make the change so how was realty like did you love it like were you like selling a bunch of homes like how that go so i was actually never any i was not a broker or uh, i wasn't in sales but we rather did residential flips yep. and in fact that is that is one of my side businesses to this day although in in recent the past couple of years we haven't done much of it my business partner and i who actually uh richard blankenship is his name he works with us as well we had oh, yeah. been to high school college together and we now work in this business together which is very cool on a separate note but he's my business partner on that and we had moved out to vegas to uh, engage in that stuff but um didn't do sales enjoyed the flipping from our side of things we didn't get too detailed in uh the the really contractor process the meat and potatoes of what flipping houses is we had business partners that did that with us but to the extent that I've engaged in it I do enjoy it for me it is purely an investment type of thing and a yeah. money making operation rather than a real passion of mine but nonetheless it is it is just that a a money making activity and um 
it's it's fun you know it is it's 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 like anything else in business it's like playing the stock market it's like trading crypto it just it, it, it's been, it's been, it's been, to some extent it's like playing poker it's a bit of a gamble when you buy a property and sometimes it pays off sometimes it doesn't and it's it's fun to see those uh those same types of things translate over to different types of industries that's awesome man all right so so translating over to different types of industries did you start at poker central like right after you graduated university of san diego or was there anything else kind of in between it was about six months where I was doing the uh, doing the real estate stuff full time, although working my way into it. Uh, to this day, I'm, I'm no expert on it, yeah. and I leaned heavily on uh, lead heavily on partners and advisors, mentors during that time. Uh, so it was a lot of education early on, and it was sort of playing catch up from what was quote unquote missed in college yep. from uh, not being in a in a real estate finance track. But then it was about. I'd have to go back and check, but I believe it was October of 14, which I graduated in the spring of that prior year that I began to work at Poker Central. So that would have been about six months post-graduation. So you And mentioned- uh, yeah, I mean, it all happened pretty fast. It's one of those things where I was approached by who the founder of the company is, Kerry Katz, yeah. uh, uh, you know, on a random day. And then within a week, I was fully employed by the company and the rest is history. There you go, man. All right. So you mentioned mentors, right? And you mentioned supporters. So who were like some of your mentors during that time as you were trying to figure out like how to start your career? You know, honestly, to be frank, the mentors that I had then, I don't really have today. And it was a lot of people around town, both uh, from San Diego and here in Vegas, who I'd approached that just the way I saw it at the time, their career was what I wanted my career to be. And I just wanted to do things that they did in certain ways and obviously absorb as much advice as I could. And then as time has gone on, and I think, I think we've all experienced like mentors change depending on what that vision is. So, you know, I, I still remain friends with a lot of those individuals, but there's, I have, I guess I have like certain pillars of mentors and uh, on my LinkedIn, if any, if anyone's there, I, I have a weird track record of different jobs and internships <laughs> and whatever. But, you know, some of my biggest mentors are like, I mentioned Carrie Katz, our founder, yeah. very successful business person. So he's to me more of like the general uh, business mindset type of uh, type of mentor and making, making a business work no matter in what sector it's in. One of my, one of my biggest mentors today is Maury Eskandani, mm-hmm. who is obviously a poker hall of famer, production legend, poker after dark, high stakes poker. The production side of things on poker was something I was obviously entirely new to from my background. So I continue to learn so much from him on the day to day. And then separately, um, our, uh, chief digital officer is a guy from uh, time incorporated originally not originally but before poker central named jr mccabe that's a guy who's who i've learned so much about the media space from and network tv and digital streaming and all these different platforms and rights uh you know broadcast rights type of stuff as we deal with uh all of our nbc sports events and espn events internationally and domestically there's just a lot of moving parts there and uh, I've got a lot of valuable insights from him. And then on a, on a separate note, one of the items on my, uh, on my LinkedIn is Jack in the box of all places and restaurant yeah. operations. Yeah. And one of my mentors from, from that company is actually, I mentioned uh, this guy, Richard, his dad was uh, number two or three until he retired recently. So same kind of deal. And he was more in the, in the people and HR side of things. So he's been a great mentor for me as it comes to managing people which yep. is something there's no guidebook on. It's something that's been a, a, a major uh, growth space for me in recent years is just working with people, which sounds mm-hmm. so simple. But when you're building a business and coming to lead a business, it's something you take for granted in the early stages, but something of, that's so important. I've come to find time and time again. And that's amazing. You know, to me, the mentor-mentee relationship, whether it's formal or informal, like it's just so important for the mentee. Like it might not have to be this formal corporate program, but just to have those people in your life that can kind of guide you in different directions is so important for career growth. And I would say to anybody watching or listening, you know, if you're in your career growing, like any one of us, you know, seek out those people for guidance because you truly can't always do it on your own. And there are going to be so many other things that people can teach you that you're never going to truly know it all. Like no matter whether you're the director of poker at the Aria, the CEO of a company or the president of a company, like you can always learn from somebody around you, whether they're younger, older, experienced, inexperienced. So I would always recommend seek out that mentorship relationship if you don't have one. So very cool, man. And when you started at Poker Central, 
what was your first role? Like, how did you kind of get your feet wet with that whole thing? Yeah. So, I mean, when I first started, it was, we, I mentioned, I've mentioned now accounting was my major. I interned in corporate communications. So like basically PR and restaurant operations. Yeah. And then I graduated and went into real estate. And then I got hired by Poker Central and did marketing, which wow. is something that is, it's pretty, it's, it's marketing's abstract. And as a marketing guy yourself, you know, that there's just so many facets of marketing and, no one is really, no one, no one can be all marketing because there's so many different things in marketing and everyone has a specialty within those things and are, are good at different things and not good at other things. So I, I began that trajectory early on. And then after a couple of years of, we had, we had a, a marketing lead on the team and absorbing as much as I could. I naturally, because I can't seem to stick to a single track, ended up going into content <laughs> <Yeah>. after that, <laughs> yeah. which, uh, which was basically, you know, planning uh, original series, putting on live events, organizing, scheduling, things like that, especially for a uh, 100 plus days a year uh, subscription service is, is quite a task. Right. And then, of course, more recently, about for the past year, I think it was like actually November of 18. So I just passed a year, then became president of the organization with a specialty in content, however. So still yeah. maintain that role while also being president. Well, that's great, man. I mean, you've got the accounting background, right? Which a lot of people in marketing content don't have. Like yeah. one of my biggest weaknesses throughout my career was that part, right? So it's like the fact that you have that and you were trained on that and educated on that and you can bring that to your current roles, I think is probably a strength. So you've grown pretty much every year, it sounds like, since you've been at Poker Central from marketing manager to director of marketing to VP of content to now president. So walk me through, when was the first time you started actually managing people. So the first time managing people, and th those those who uh, who know our business will think this is funny. My my first employee I remember vividly was Brent Hanks, yep. who who many will know well as commentator, on air yep. personality, podcast guy, and sort of uh, a Swiss Army knife of different roles in this business, which which. I'll say off the bat makes for the best kind of employee, which, which is why, why he's so valued an organization and uh, one of my best friends to this day. But um, it was, uh, it was interesting. My, I, I remember, like I said, I remember vividly my first time doing an interview with him. He was actually a referral from Carrie originally. And they, they met playing at the poker table and he just happened to mention he had a kid on the way and uh, was looking for something that was more stable than the poker profession. And we met over, I think it was a game of Monday night football or maybe Thursday night football and had a beer at yard house. And that yeah. was like, that was my idea of like having an interview. And of course that's yeah. me being like a, uh, manager in my early twenties, like, oh, yeah. let's take advantage <laughs> and just go go drink somewhere. Yeah, um, uh, and it, guilty and that, as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which, 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 I not that I would say I would do anything differently today, but it's just it's funny in hindsight. So, you know, I, I'd speed up ahead to where we are today, and like that has worked out ten times over, and. He's a guy who uh, has been very flexible through our organization, as people can see on the outside with all the roles that he fills with, uh, you know, big, doing our podcast. And he was actually up till 5 a.m. this morning doing Aussie Millions coverage with mm -hmm. Jason Somerville. And he puts together all of our Poker After Dark and other games, does live event planning with us. So that was my first, and I will say that I was very lucky to get someone like that, that was just like a, a soaring success to this day in the organization. And so from there, it's been just compounding on that. And to, to, to date, although I haven't been the individual to hire all these people, we have full-time, like around 20 to 25 full-time people in the, in the company. So there's been a number of people that have come since Brent and we've been very lucky with our track record with who we have on the team. And as, as I hope it's seen on the outside, we have a, we have not many people who put in a lot of work and a lot of hours and a lot of, and do a lot of great work for the company. And I, I what it all boils down to is I'm just blessed to have, have gotten so lucky in, in finding the people on our team. Amen to that, man. Shout out to B. Hanks That's right. and uh, the whole poker central poker go team. So, so, you know, Early on in my career, I was also given the responsibility to manage people. And that was one of the, the most interesting transitions in my career from a leadership standpoint, you know, going from not managing anybody to managing one or two people and then managing 10 or whatever, or 30. So what advice would you give, you know, people in their career who are just starting to potentially manage people or have a team? Like what advice would you give them for that transition from not managing people to now 
okay, you're a, you're a leader, you're a boss, you're a, you're officially managing this person's career and the job they're doing. What advice would yeah. you give those folks? I mean, the best, the best advice that I I've seen, uh, go wrong for a number of people in honestly both in, 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 in and outside our organization is just care about people. And it, it does sound so simple, but a lot of times in business, especially in the more financially and accounting driven sectors, it's so easy to look at someone as a line item in a spreadsheet mm -hmm. where you're paying them X amount and they, if they don't meet X, Y, Z criteria, they can be removed. But there's so many, uh, you know, widgets and cogs and things that go on inside a person's head and their lives, things they care about, passions, uh, interests that aren't accounted for in, in that analysis that need to be taken into consideration. And that, you know, that's, that comes into people management. It's, it's, um, it, it goes beyond just directing and then you get into the management part of things and actually listening and, and caring and working with people. And that's, I've found that that's how you've you achieved the most success as an organization is just being able to care about people and, and making people feel cared for, cared for. I mean, that's, that's something that I think everyone wants is to be working somewhere that they feel like they've heard, they're heard, they're seen, they're acknowledged and they're appreciated. Yep. And then Sean, you, that reminds me of, of the same kind of answer you gave when, when we interviewed you and we were just getting started with this podcast that so many times it's about what makes that person tick as a person and caring for them <laughs> just as you'd care for a friend or family member, because that's ultimately what's going to get the most out of them. And it's ultimately going to, what's going to like help their career too. And, you know, you know, got, we're, we've all been in the corporate game. There are so many leaders that don't do that. Like there are so many leaders out there that don't do that. So, you know, for you to have that mindset is awesome. And uh, that's cool to hear a good reminder for all of us. And I think a good, a good piece of advice for folks who are just starting to manage people, you know, take, take into consideration what Sam said and really factor that into how you would go about leading your teams. So cool, man. That's awesome. Now, what was the jump like when you went from kind of like your, your marketing jobs there to, okay, Hey, you're over all content. Like what was that jump? Like what, what were some of the responsibilities that you got into where it was like, okay, this is now I'm a VP. I'm in charge of all content. I got to help drive this thing forward at, a, at an executive level. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't, it actually wasn't as, difficult as one might think and it harkens back to what we talked about earlier which was my origins in poker which was as a fan and a viewer and at the end of the day and i, I will say let me let me backtrack when i was working in marketing it was primarily for that tv network uh the 24 7 channel and at the time we had a, t a couple guys from discovery who managed programming a couple guys named dan and john who uh were brilliant at, at the in the TV space. And we talked about mentorship. Those two guys taught me a lot about content, things to look for, the process that goes into working on original programming from uh, content development to taking pitches to pre-production to screening uh, you know, episodes, doing edits and, retro, and fitting them for the audience and fitting them for what was the TV channel and today is Poker Go. And, at the end of the day, coupled with coupled with where my background was in the game and where things are now and sort of my role, what it all boils down to is like just put create things that people want to watch. And it again, it sounds so simple, but that's that's all that really is. And that all starts with things that I want to watch as a viewer and someone who would be a poker go subscriber if well, I, I am a Pogo subscriber, but a Pogo subscriber, regardless if I work for the business or not. So then, you know, then you kind of, you kind of throw some stuff out there and then do a little bit of tweaking, guess and check, look at the back end, see what's, who's viewing what, and then you just create more of that and you just rinse and repeat over and over again. And I, I that, that is an oversimplified version of how it actually works. But that being said, that's what it all boils down to. And I think that's, that's, there's a, there's a lesson in there that I think is important. I continue to remind myself today, which is, whether it be whether it be content and poker or whatever business it is, it's never a perfect science, mm -hmm. and you kind of just have to, to an extent, make shit up along the way mm -hmm. and guess and check and and fail a couple times and then but then be right a couple times and and see what works, and you know just just enjoy the process the through and through. So that's to, to answer the question more directly. It was it was not a difficult transition or even as difficult as I thought it would be originally, mm -hmm. and um, you know at the end of the day, it just all boils down to 
going with your gut and, and doing what you think is, uh, is the right thing to do as not only a business person, but as a fan. And I love what you said about failure, right? Like so many people who are growing in their careers or, or trying to grow their own businesses or et cetera, like you're not going to make the right decision every single time. Like you're going to be wrong and you're going to make mistakes. You're going to screw shit up. But at the same time, like if you don't give yourself a chance to fail, then you're not going to succeed very much either, or you're not going to do great things either. Like you've got to be able to take those risks. And then in, in, in your career, would you agree that, you know, many times when you fail at something, it's kind of like, okay, how do you acknowledge it, reflect on it and just move on from it that actually yeah. sets your career back on the right path or sets your team back on the right path? Well, it's also, I, I think as a, as a part of that, it's, it's an ego thing where yeah. it's not only, it's not only being willing to make mistakes and make the wrong decision, but then being willing to acknowledge you made the wrong decision and not go down the road of that wrong decision just because you want to prove that you were right. Mm -hmm. Cause that can be, especially when you're talking about like when you're like live event, original programming production, my world, it's like if, if I, if I, if I produce a show and we find out that no one likes it and it stinks and no one watches it, if I continue to make that show just to prove the point that this is the right show to make and people will like it at some point, I just have to force it down their throats and just so I could be right. That can get very expensive. And chances are the early indication that you saw originally are not going to change the more you make of it. In fact, they could go the opposite direction and people will lose interest even more. So that's just, I mean, that's just an example, but it's, it's a, it's a microcosm of a larger dynamic, which is just not being willing to admit that you're wrong. And be willing to, to make future decisions based upon that. I love it. And again, something that for those of you who are getting into leadership, like it's okay to admit when you're wrong. In fact, if and when you do that, like the respect that's earned from your teams and your peers tends to go higher than those that don't do that. Right? Yeah. It's amazing how that works. So, okay, cool, man. So, so all of a sudden, not all of a sudden because you earned it and you worked hard to get it you are now the president of Poker Central, right? And, and kind of Poker Go and that entire operation and the team is on your back, obviously with, with partners like Maury and et cetera. Yeah. But now you're going from seeking out approvals and I'm sure you still do in certain, certain things. But now it's like, you're the guy that's basically responsible for the path of the company and, mm -hmm. and where you might've been going to people for strategic direction and et cetera in your past jobs, now people are coming to you, right? So what has that transition been like compared to like the weight on yourself as, as a, as a career leader and president of a company? Yeah. I mean, that's, I would say this transition has probably been more challenging just because of that. Like it's, I had, I sort of had my little, my little world for a, for a period of time. And, but then once you open things up and you're responsible for all aspects of the organization, that's obviously a game changer. Mm -hmm. So it, the past years, I mean, we talked about the accounting skill set, and I think I've been well equipped to take on a more holistic management role of the organization because of the diverse background that I have, yeah. where I can go into marketing, go into content, go into accounting, finance, legal, and be able to understand and speak intelligently on those things because of the background that I have, which has sort of given me a leg up on things uh, from the get go. But speaking of uh, accounting, the first day, I, or like, I'm, uh, let's not be dramatic to the first day, probably the first week that I was, that I became president, I went through all the financials dating back, I think it was two years and went deep into the next year's budget, which at that point was 2019 and basically worked with our accounting team, went line by line. What's this? What's that? How can we save on this? Why aren't we spending more on that? And going through with a fine tooth comb early on to sort of right the ship. Not that it was necessarily going the wrong direction, but I wanted to, at a very intimate granular level, learn the ins and outs of the business, which again, I think has, which is something I think that leaders can tend to overlook. And a, a title can be so sexy when you get it. And you think that when you are a CEO or president or SVP, whatever, a chairman, whatever it is, that you then don't have to worry about the details anymore and like those other people to deal with that. But especially when you're talking a startup type organization, I mean, Tommy, you could certainly speak to this, a startup type organization where you are operating with a very lean team, mm -hmm. you just can't afford to let the details slide. Mm -hmm. So I went in with the mindset of, I'm going to know this business inside and out. I'm going to know everything that goes on. I'm not going to micromanage, but I'm going to know about it. And I'm going to be able to make decisions and 
and work within the system to shift things on the day to day to so that the small things add up to where we want to be in the long term. Yeah. Well, you got to seek first to understand. Like yes. Even exactly. even as you grow, if you're not seeking first to understand what you're now responsible for, because like you said, there is no book written about it. You got to kind of write it yourself. That's right. Then you're going to let yourself down. You're going to let your team down, the company down. So I think it was very smart of you, you know, and I'm no expert, but I think it was very smart of you to seek first to understand because anytime I've done that in my career, Sean, I know you did that when you got to the ARIA you can only be a better leader and take the organization where you want it to go by really understanding how everything works up front. I think that's a really good piece of advice for anybody who's uh, tuning in right now. Well, cool, man. So when did you start working with this guy, Sean and the partnership with the Aria and what's it like working with the poker boss regularly? I mean, do I need to give you a hug? Are you okay? Like, <laughs> How's that been working with, with Aria Poker? I should have seen this coming. I totally should have seen this <laughs> oh, coming. Oh, yeah. You know, this was... How's it been working with Aria Poker and that partnership set up you guys have? No, it's, I mean, it's our working with Aria is great. And it's, it, it's the fact that we've scaled up the partnership and we continue to scale up to this day speaks to how it's been working with them, where the results speak for themselves. We actually, this, this predates Sean. I've, some might say I've been at Aria longer than Sean has. But... <laughs> We, we began doing our events at ARIA back in 2015. Uh, we, we were moving in and out of the convention space in the back of the casino property, which if you can imagine what goes into a live poker production for a TV network, especially a live one, which it was in 2016 in the convention space, if memory serves me correct, it is a pain in the ass and really inefficient to, to be loading in and, and loading out a, a live TV trucks and all that set. Uh, out of a hotel convention center. So that's when the Poker Go Studio came to be. And it was it was a, a culmination of a lot of work by a lot of people, as Sean can certainly attest to, where we knew that we wanted to be in the poker streaming business and we knew we were going to be in the poker streaming business for a long time to come. And given the ambition of the business model we had in mind, which is what it is today in Poker Go, we knew it was not going to be practical to be to have this roaming, uh, roaming production studio that whether it be all at Aria or other properties, we're basically coming in and out on an event by event basis, and it would wouldn't work from a cost perspective. So, Pokego Studio came to be, and the partnership with Aria to date has been wonderful. Uh, There's obviously no better place to be on the strip than Aria, and this is a this is a very true fact, which Son knows. But uh, I I. I practice what I preach because I'm getting married in, in April and it's at the Aria. So All right. I, uh, so it's, I just, I, I love, I love the property and I, I, there's nowhere else that I'd rather be certainly so for, uh, for the business as it is today. Congratulations, man. Thank April. you. That's great. Thank you. Um, what a wonderful phase of life I will tell you. And, uh, <laughs> you know, balancing marriage and a, leadership job like this and eventually a family, it is definitely an evolution as well. So no doubt you'll tackle that like you've tackled everything else and congratulations on the upcoming marriage, man. Thank Tom, you. Tom, appreciate that. Tom and I are, so. Tom and I are definitely going to just keep nodding our heads here because <laughs> we realize that our wives watch this and listen to our podcast. So we blink, always blink say, twice if you need saving. Yeah. Right? <laughs> we, we always say if it wasn't for, the support from our wives, which is an absolute true thing. Like neither one of us would be able to do his career, my business, or even this podcast. I mean, so many times the kids get home from school and it wasn't, you know, for her, they'd be coming in here saying, what's up, daddy? <laughs> you know? Yeah, no. And, and, I, and I, I obviously not married yet, but I've been with, um, I mean, I've been with Morgan, my fiance for five years. So basically if it aligns yeah. where I started working for the company in October of 14 and we started dating in January of 15. So yep. about the, pretty much the entire time I've been with the business, I've been with her and she's been instrumental, I think, in, in my personal growth uh, through the organization and yeah, there's a lot of days you come home and you had a really shitty day and to have someone to just be a sounding board, but a lot of times work you through things and be a voice of reason and, uh, you know, just, just get by sometimes is, is so valuable. And so I, I certainly credit her with a lot of the success that uh, not only me, but the organization has had. Oh, hundred percent, man. I love it. All right. So wait, wait, wait. I want to hear from Sean. What he thinks about the partnership? Boom. Same, same, <laughs> on the, same question. On the spot. 
This isn't my interview. <laughs> What's going on? I, I got to go back and forth turned. here. So tables have turned. The Aria view on the Poker Central Poker Go partnership. No, um, obviously the partnership has been amazing. Um, not only from an exposure uh, side for the property. Obviously, Poker Central does a lot to get Aria uh, global recognition. Um, and uh, it's... It, from a selfish note, it's kind of been a, uh, a big piece of my career. Um, you know, I did start at Aria in 2015, by the way, but you're right. You did do one event before I got there <laughs> He's got um, you. <laughs> in the convention center. But I do remember the convention center days. Um, I do remember actually handing out the uh, ring in 2016 in right. one of our ballrooms. That was uh, very interesting. But yeah, the partnership has been, uh, you know, there's, there's, uh, there's bumps in the road for every partnership, of course. And nothing like this has ever been done, uh, at least not on this scale. I, I've worked in this business for a long time, and I've worked with partners like the World Poker Tour and others to televise events, but never on this grandiose scale that Poker Central uh, does it. And I'll be honest, in the beginning, we were all kind of like skeptical, which you always should be for a uh, new business venture and a new partnership um, but here we are almost five years later, uh, still grinding away. You know, the, the poker go studio, we're coming up on, uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, two years, three two years, years. Oh, two years, two years. Um, and, uh, you know, we've been doing filming before that on property at Aria. We were moving it around and stuff like that. So that's why again, I thought three years. I, we, 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 no one knows about the temp space. Temp, no one knows about it. No, <laughs> the no, temp no. spaces. They, even, they do now. They, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there were a lot of hurdles, but at the end of the day, I think uh, both sides of the equation have definitely benefited from the uh, partnership. And uh, I know my team is really uh, on board with the, with the idea. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's just been great for not just Poker Central, not just for Aria, but for the poker industry as a whole. Yeah. And I was going to go to that point too. Like, I know I work with both you guys from a business standpoint, right? But at the same time, as a poker fan, as a poker player, I couldn't imagine the Poker Go studio being anywhere else, right? And to me, it's like, you've got what you're trying to do, Sam, in leading Poker Central and Poker Go and innovating the industry from an entertainment standpoint. And when you think about the pinnacle of Las Vegas in terms of poker, you think of the Aria. So it was just like this perfect match. And knowing the leadership at Aria Poker and the leadership at Poker Central, you know, regardless of whatever business discussions have to happen in terms of partnership, the passion is there to grow this thing for the betterment of the industry. And that's what's so beautiful about it. Um, and no yeah. doubt that, that Poker Go is, you know, I wrote it down here, like one of the leaders in evolving poker entertainment. Like, I think I really believe that. So talk to me about that, Sam. Talk to me about your vision for kind of like evolving poker entertainment. Yeah, well, I appreciate you asking that. And, um, you know, it's I don't like to do this, but I, I selfishly don't think that our team gets enough credit for, you know, what what we've done for poker. And again, I hate, I hate to sort of pat ourselves on the back, but I am I am proud of everyone across the team and, and what we've done. Um, because we have so many brands in our portfolio on Poker Go, Poker Central, there's, I don't think there, there's some people don't understand to the extent to which we have put poker in different places. And I could, I mean, I could go for days and days on the different deals that we have with different distribution outlets, but you know, we do, we do 39, uh, no, 36 episodes per year on NBC Sports, which air several times. We've established a Monday night pillar of Monday night poker across our few events on uh, NBC Sports on a weekly basis, especially during non-hockey seasons. ESPN, of course, we have WSOP. We're the ones that do that deal. We put more live hours of coverage on uh, ESPN, ESPN2 than there ever have been before, plus the episodes that air later in the year. I think it's typically 15 episodes, total 15 episodes that we do on a year-to-year -year basis. We've taken and packaged the WSB bracelet events. And for the most part, those are on Poker Go and uh, will continue to be on Poker Go. But last year, we did a partnership with CBS Sports and CBS All Access, where uh, CBS All Access streamed a number of the final tables from the bracelet events and then put episodes later in the year on their CBS Sports Network. And... All of these things in a vacuum, they're impressive. They're, I think they're impressive in and of themselves. But when you start to compound them, you start to see things like 
the one that comes to mind is CBS All Access, and you see uh, you see this, the WSB bracelet events next to marquee television series like the new Picard Star Trek yeah, debut yeah. Or, or, or premiere that's going to come this month, which is a, the nerd in me is very excited for. You start you, you start to legitimize poker, and not to say it's not legitimate, but we have to be honest with ourselves, the masses may not see poker as seriously as perhaps they once did. Yeah, right. But with all this momentum, you're starting to see a reappearance, a reemergence of poker in mainstream media. And I can go, I guess I can go for days on, on little micro examples, but uh, it was not this past year, but the year prior to that, we had we had uh, poker on Primetime Sports Center with SVP twice for, for Doyle's last event and then the uh, the absurd, absurd Colossus celebration in Bad Beat. So you're starting to see these little like little pockets of, of uh, momentum uh, from the poker space which come out of the events that we do and where we put them. And it's something that we're proud of. And I think it's something that we're going to see a lot more of in the coming years. And I can't really say yet, but we're working on some major deals as we speak for 2020 and beyond uh, multi-year deals that is not only going to continue this, but accelerate it even further. And we're, I'm, we're very excited to share it when we're able to. That's amazing. And you know what? It's like, I always love getting in these conversations with other players or other, you know, small business owners in the industry. Um, you know, you know, Berkey solve for why you're right. And yeah. And some of these people who are just so passionate about the evolution of poker entertainment, and we all kick around all these ideas and we could do this and we could do that and blah, blah, blah. But it's like poker go is actually doing it. Right. We try and, to, and, and yeah. that should be, that should be acknowledged. Right. And, and I think the more the community can come together with the right influencers and the right people to support what you're doing, but then also for poker go and poker central to support what a lot of the players are doing to try and evolve poker entertainment. That's only going to do great things for our community as a whole. And I think you're right. Maybe, you know, the days of um, the boom when poker reached the masses. Yeah, they're behind us, but there's no reason they can't also be ahead of us. Right? Yeah. Is it, is it a harder hill to climb than it was, you know, 10 years ago? Sure. But I think we'll get there. And I think we'll get there through what the World Poker Tour is doing, through what Poker Go is doing, WSOP. We'll get there. Um, but it's cool to hear so many of these distribution deals that you guys have, because I don't know that it's truly known by everybody in the industry, Yeah, um, but it should be acknowledged and your team should get some great recognition for it. So well, talk, talk and really talk. quick. That's, that's, a, that's an important point. I want to, I want to jump on that. And I referenced yeah. it a little bit earlier, but the whole poker boom mentality. And that's, again, the advantage for me is that I never experienced that business wise. And I don't have, I don't look in the worst way possible. I don't look at this through rose colored glasses in that it, I like like missing the way it was because this is all that I know. And while there is optimism, especially in recent years with the momentum around iGaming as a sort of coattail in sports betting, there's reason to be optimistic. And of course, we'd all want that to happen, but we're not building a business with that in mind. We're not necessarily saying, well, this works if that. This is, we're building this for what poker is today, and that's okay with us. And that is from someone who knows intimately what the general media, what the biggest media companies in the world think about poker. And it's positive. Mm -hmm. It may not be outward. It may not be at the same scale as the NFL's, MLB's, NHL's of the world or whatever major sports you want to reference. But there's optimism there. There's positivity there. And you're seeing it in the sponsorship. So that's another, that's another thing I'm very proud of and something that um, – my friend and colleague Richard has done a great job of is bringing in the Amazons is bringing in the dollar shave clubs, bringing in the, the marquee liquor, uh, fast food brands into the poker space and not only getting them into the space, but bringing them back time and time again. And it, it goes again too. like, we have some key sponsorships teed up and early this year that we're looking forward to uh, finalizing and announcing, but it's just another one of those things where it's, again, not only continuing, but accelerating. And I think that speaks to the health of the industry at large and the momentum that's behind it and the growth that's to come. I love it. And you, you took the words right out of my mouth because I was kind of going down the road of, you know, you guys are doing a great job of attracting these, not just like small business, medium business sponsors, but true fortune 500, 200 type sponsors to spend money in the poker space, right? That is very challenging to do. Like a big part of my career before Faded Spade was in leading marketing and, and sponsorships and, and trying to find like the best routes to go. And anytime I would try and get some type of poker 
um, sponsorship or partnership going, it always met challenges at the top because people associated it with gaming or gambling or whatever, right? So talk to us about that. Sponsorship is extremely important for our industry, but it's also extremely challenging yeah. to get sponsors. So how does Poker Go go about that? Like what's your value proposition? And if you were speaking, if somebody from you know, a Fortune 500 company was watching this, you know, what would be your value proposition in terms of why they should work with Poker Go for partnership and sponsorship? Yeah, I mean, it's a very good point. And you, we've, as you can guess, we've heard every objection in the book from uh, poker is gambling, poker is a sin sport, poker isn't a real sport, and all of the above. Some are, some are diff at different places on the scale of morality. Some, for some people, it's just a matter of it being not a sport. Sometimes people think it's a sin sport or immoral gambling, but it's, what all boils down to is that it's not, they don't legitimize it. Right. Basically, our pitch is A, about poker in that it's a mind sport. It is in the same vein as esports, And that's something that we can talk about too and how we sort of parlayed poker into an esports business mm -hmm. uh, separate from that. But it is, a, it is in the same category as eSports as a mind sport with, with real cards. It's, you, there's a reason why you see so many poker players come from eSports and vice versa, eSports players come into poker. The one that comes to mind for me is Bryn Kenny, the all-time winningest player in the world. He's got, he had his start in Magic the Gathering, which today is, uh, you know, probably a B or C list type of esport activity in the industry to this day. So poker is legitimate, but then secondary to that, regardless of what you feel about the game, what you, what your opinion of it is, we're selling a demographic. We're selling a passionate fan base and enthusiastic fan base of young millennial males, which is, one of, if not the most coveted demographic in all of advertising. So if you, it, that's, if, if you can't sell poker, you can at least sell that audience, that demographic. And if you can overcome the moral hurdle, which as, as time has gone by and as it becomes more mainstream, becomes easier and easier to do, then the demographic is an easy sell at that point. And that's, and that's sort of how we, how we frame the pitch. Yeah. And the value, right? Like what yeah. you'd, what you'd, what a, a corporate sponsor would pay a, Poker Go, a WPT, and et cetera, you know, for the same type of uh, actually much uh, deeper activations than what you might pay HBO or what you might pay sure. a network direct for a 30 second spot, you're going to get so much more value, so many more activations. You're going to get so much more branding calls to action. And like you said, I think this should, should be repeated. It is a large, because poker fan base is large. The industry from a business standpoint might be small to medium, but the industry, the fan base of players who watch is very large and we are yeah. fiercely loyal. Yeah. Like we, we will buy the products. We will support the brands that support the industry. It's almost like NASCAR in a way, right? Yeah. In that respect. So I think that needs to be, needs to be reminded, like that truly is, is something there. So good work on that front. I love it. I mean, I can tell your, your mix of personal passion with business purpose and, um, you know, no doubt you guys will continue bringing in the right sponsors. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I mean, it is um, to your point, and that's that's something that I, I like to hammer home in these types of conversations. Is poker's not like anything else in, and like any other sport. And, and you, you mentioned the integration specifically. That's obviously something that we do a lot of, and you can get so creative with it. I love to look back at like the early poker boom WSOP uh, episodes, and, and I need to worry a little bit because of some of the zany things they did with their sponsors. <laughs> You're talking about the the degree all in moment and all these like crazy things that they came up with. And we do a lot of that to this day, but it's so customizable and it's so sponsor friendly for that reason, where if you have, it's a, sort of a blank, blank canvas and you can do anything with it versus football where you have your X, Y, Z integrations, you have your billboards, but there's not that much you can do within the actual game just because it disrupts the actual flow of the content. Whereas in poker, you can pretty much layer whatever you want in there. But then as, as a, as a game and to your point about, about the passionate audience, it's unlike any other sport out there. And I've, I've said this time and time again in these, so I apologize if anyone out here is <laughs> listening and hearing the same thing over, but it's, I find it to be aspirational and accessible unlike anything else is. And it's the sort as much as those are almost opposites there, they go working hand in hand here because I can watch the quarter million dollar super high roller bowl or the million dollar Triton event or any of these other super high stakes events. And I could want to be there. I will probably never be there, but I can aspire to that. And on the flip side of that, poker is accessible in that while I may not be able to achieve that right now, I can go down to my local card room, no matter where I'm at in the country for the most part, and 
sit down and play in a game. And even beyond that, if you're talking about, you know, even in the light of the lower stakes WSOP events they announced, I can sit down with with a group of players or in that in, in the case of WSOP, sometimes the best players in the world and in theory have a chance of competing. Although skill nets out over time, I could sit across from Phil Ivey at a table and I could probably playing heads up win 20, 25 percent of times, which are pretty good odds. Whereas as I like to compare it to UFC, if I get into the ring with Conor McGregor, I'm getting my ass kicked 10 out of 10 times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it just it brings it brings a, a different dynamic to the game that I think is not captured in, in most other sports, which is the ability to compete no matter your no matter your skill level and the ability to access the game uh, no matter who you are. That's great. That's going to be a clip we roll with when we promote this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, man. You mentioned you mentioned the um, you know you mentioned the tie between poker and esports, right? And I believe what you're involved in is E Stars Studios. Is that right? E-Star That's right. Studios. So so talk to us about E Stars Studios. Yeah, sure. So that was we kind of we backdoored into that business, to be honest with you. So this came from, I referenced Amazon as a sponsor. Uh, they came to us actually in our first events, the Amazon app store uh, sponsored the first super high roller bowl, super high roller cash game and super high roller celebrity shootout, which was shot in July of 2015. And the Amazon guys came to our set to as like sort of the usual sales trip. We, they, we bring them in, we wine and dine them. One of the guys is actually, um, the East star studios president now. And one of my best friends to this day, we came out, they saw our production. They continued to sponsor our productions, continued to partner with us. They saw the level of, uh, production that we brought to poker and wanting to get into the esports space, specifically in the app store, in producing mobile-driven esports events, they said to themselves, "We we feel that the I guess the personality of esports is not captured in any of the with the, in any other production companies out there, and it's a lot like poker in that sense. But I would say poker is even amplified because take for example, the WSB main event. How do we take how do we take two weeks of coverage and?" take 7,000 plus players and boil it down to the top nine and all the way through capture their personality and know the nuances of production and features and everything else to be able to tell a great story while not knowing what the hell is going to happen all the way through. Mm -hmm. So they saw that dynamic and said, this probably works well in esports. And they ended up, we ended up partnering with them on an event in, I think what was actually late 2016, it was called champions of fire, a uh, mobile esports tournament and same kind of deal. We, we brought in some influencers and produced this event for them. It was uh, driven by a number of mobile titles. One of the ones that come to mind was like a Pac-Man game, which isn't a traditional esport, but uh, was competitive nonetheless. Oh, and we told great, ultimately we told great stories. At a certain point, po- televised poker is not about the game of poker, but it's about the stories that it tells, which I think is so important to capture and something that we pride ourselves on and in the productions that we do. And we brought that to esports for them. And the next thing you know, it was like, wait, we can kind of do this well. And we can translate the skill set of telling poker stories into telling esports stories. And that's what got us to where we are today, which is producing esports events. So that's great. The business has evolved since then, of course, uh, over the past three years, and E-Star Studios is the production wing of it. We do white label production, like what the business was founded on. We produce events for a number of different gaming developers, publishers, the ones that we've done events for um, for EA. We did a Madden event. We've done Epic. We did Fortnite, uh, PUBG, and a plethora of others, pretty much any big title out there we've done an event for it. We have an owned and operated series called the World Showdown of Esports or WSOE. It's basically like a fight, a fight card style esports tournament where the weight classes are gaming titles and players come in to defend their title event over event. As you can see, the whole theme of storytelling carries on here. It's not about the game. It's about the storyline of X player beats Y player to take the title. And then uh, even beyond that, we've, we've launched a... I call it a social betting platform. It's rooted in sweepstakes where you guess outcomes of various esports events, and that gives you a chance to win real prizes. So it's kind of, I hate to call it this, but a watered down sports betting on esports. But uh, it's an engagement platform, I guess you could yeah. say. And that you can you can kind of see this ecosystem form of developing relationships with the partners and bringing them into our own and operated events, and then generating interest in our own and operated events by putting them on the engagement platform. 
platform and in creating this sort of engagement loop across all properties. And then how do you integrate all of that into poker, right? In terms of engagement. And that's the full circle. Like we've seen what's happening in the industry, like Allied Esports Entertainment, World Poker Tour, integrating the two. What Poker Go you guys are doing with Eastar Studios and integrating the two. So it's look at Twitch. Twitch is a huge esports gaming program and now yeah. also one of the biggest poker streaming platforms. So I feel like over the next 10 years, we're just going to see our two industries align even further. Yeah. Um, and I, think I mean, how, how you, from, how you engage, sorry to interrupt, how you engage and consume both of them is so similar. I, I think the only difference is going to be demographics where esports will skew more female and younger, but it's the same in that it's, I mean, I hate to go I, to go back to that spiel of accessibility and, asp and aspirations, but it's the same type of the dynamic there where I may not be able to compete on the greatest stage of, you know, the, the, the soccer stadiums in Korea where people play League of Legends, but I can go back to my computer and download League of Legends right now and, and compete and yeah. go play in local tournaments and uh, try to start a career out of it if I wanted to. Maybe I'm uh, probably actually for esports. I'm probably over the hill at this point. But um, <laughs> okay, those, maybe, you, maybe younger, you can. I can't. Maybe you can. <laughs> no, I I, so I, that's it's actually crazy. Esports like the peak age in esports is like 16, and you're by the time you're 21, you're it's it's micro. It's like nanoseconds of difference, but your reaction time has doled so far by like 21, 22, 23 where your career is basically over and you then transition to becoming like a coach or a team manager. Wow. Well, that's when they it's take crazy. up poker. That's when they take up kind of poker. Brutal that, <laughs> it's, it exactly. sounds kind of brutal that you could be 22 years old and get hit with the okay boomer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's like, a, it's a very short window. <laughs> I love it. I don't even know where to go from here now. <laughs> All right. So look, as we start kind of wrapping this up, Sam, thanks for this. I know, I know you know, you're, you're busy with your schedule and, and we've been on for about an hour now. So I want to wrap up with a, with a few uh, questions and then give you the chance to kind of, kind of summarize where, where you kind of want your career to go and, and any advice you'd give to, to sure. other people growing in their career. And then also, you know, plug some things for, for Poker Go coming up. So um, through this journey of yours, right, you know, you've grown quickly, right? You've excelled quickly. Um, that's something I can relate to in, in my career for the first 10 years of my career. And there is some really great things. There are some really great things about that. And there also are some, some challenges with that. Right. So yeah. what would you say to, to those who are experiencing that in terms of the challenges you've faced and, and how you kind of overcome some of those challenges? Yeah. I mean, to me, for me personally, and I said this before our talk, but a lot of this, a lot of my advice is more of just telling myself things. The biggest challenge I've had through the process is in the way of confidence, where as a young person, there's a certain stigma attached to lack of experience and a certain doubt that comes with that. And it's easy to internalize that doubt and to, when making key decisions, question everything. And, and, in, and to some extent, really feel like you're not deserving in a way when it comes to especially when you talk about titles and as, like going through an organization and rising uh, through promotions, you know, there's certainly times where doubt keeps into my head and I say, like, well, why me? Like, I really, I don't really know what I'm doing. I'm not going to be able to do this. And you, that then sort of snowballs into really what becomes insecurity in a way. So I think my best advice, which again is more of giving advice to myself while also giving advice to everyone else is just like, have confidence even if you have to fake it and when you don't know what to do go with your gut and don't look back and don't second guess decisions you make along the way understanding to our earlier conversation not all the decisions will be the right decision but they were the right decision at the time and that's the best you can do and it's the, the funny thing is and this is sort of business in the context of poker but that's not any different than what poker is and really what anything in life is. It's just, it's just decision-making and risk mitigation where yeah. <laughs> you, do, you, do, you do your best at the time and you try to avoid disasters along the way. But even with there isn't, whenever there is a disaster, you, you go up in flames and you bust out and you enter the next tournament the next day. And that's, it's as simple as that when it all boils down. I was uh, talking to a friend the other day and I was like, career growth and then also and or trying to grow like a business. It's just like a giant multi-table tournament you've just got to navigate so much shit yep. but like and the reward at the end and maybe you don't even ever get to that reward at the end but it's the journey you got to be in love with sure other than the result you're really you're doing. not gonna win every tournament yeah yeah 
Yeah. I mean, you could, you could, you could final table and be perfectly happy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or cash. And yeah, perfect, exactly. Or take min, I'll take a min cash. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, man. So, um, what's coming up next in your career, man? I mean, how, how do you feel about your trajectory at poker central and, and what would, what would you want for yourself over the next few years? Yeah. So, I mean, me personally, I'm, I hate to use the word content because that insinuates complacency, but I am content. I mean, I've got, I've got a lot in my life is as discussed earlier personally going on too, where it's kind of, I have my head in a lot of places, but that being said, the core of my work, and as this is going to be a really unfulfilling answer, but the core of my work is behind the scenes. There's a reason why I'm not, as Sean can attest to, I'm not on the floor much of our events these days. I'm lucky enough that we have the team here that has live poker down to a science where we're basically a humming machine with the events that we do now. Uh, the key events, the event expansions are in the way of the international events that we're doing. So we had uh, we had Super High Level London in September. We had Bahamas in partnership with Party Poker in November. And then in a few days, we start Australian Poker Open, followed by Super High Level Australia out at the Star Gold Coast, which is going to be an interesting experience for us in sort of managing from afar a live event production on a, such a weird time zone. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then we're actually sending the team from Vegas out there to do that production, which is a first time for us as well so a lot of a lot of wild cards there but we're looking forward to it we're hoping the players come out in uh in, in droves for that one uh we're optimistic and excited to uh, see who shows up and excited to see uh the inaugural event so that's a big live event piece but i was what i was getting to on sort of the back end side of things we have a lot in the way of uh new products new deals new sponsorships and other exciting developments that we're working on behind the scenes um we have a, uh, a a key new brand that we have acquired uh, recently, as of about two weeks ago, that we will be announcing in the coming weeks. Uh, we, I guess I mentioned earlier, we're actively working on a couple big deals in the media distribution side of things that we'll be announcing in the coming weeks as well, probably the next couple of months. We, of course, have WSOP this summer uh, with our ESPN partnership. And then we're going to be launching some new products as well in the marketplace in the not so distant future. So it's a lot of, uh, for those that have done like product development, that's probably my biggest gap in my skill set is like working on requirements and building websites and building applications. That's a lot of what I'm doing right now, which is why I'm just like, like, you know, nose, nose to the ground, focusing on that work so that I don't, I don't manage to F it up, but uh, (laughs) it's going to be great. Like, like six months from now, I think the business will look, exponentially different than it does today. And I'm very excited to see what that looks like. I love it. And you took the, the next question right out of my mouth is what's next for Poker Go? And it sounds like international expansion, continued new original co- uh, content, bringing in as many sponsors as we possibly can and just promoting the game globally as much as possible. Am I, am I close? And making money. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, 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 hate, I hate to be the, well. hate to be like the suit, but you know, it's it's jokes aside. It's uh, it's it's great to bring bring new people, bring new sponsors, bring new media partners into the game, and it's something we're doubling down on this year. So, like I said, it's it's just it's a lot of new stuff to come. So, look forward to the next six months. It's going to be good. All right, and Sam, parting words for for anybody listening or watching our growing Faded Spade podcast, what's the best advice you could give to them along their entire career journey and career growth? Best advice. I mean, I would certainly go back to the, um, the confidence thing, you know, make the best decision at the time. Don't look back. Don't question be, but also at the same time, be willing to admit and learn from your mistakes. Uh, get to know people. I think that's another big thing I've learned along the way is just, it's not about what you know, it's who you know. And that's such a cliche, but it rings so true. And it's the example of that's my college stuff where it's like, you know, I got into the, I, I started my career and then got into this business, not because of my expertise, but rather who I knew. And then I learned the rest along the way. And that's such a key part of this is don't, don't get the job you want and then rest on your laurels, but, you know, actively be learning, seeking information, absorbing information, not only from uh, resources, but the most valuable resource, which is the people around you, mentors, things like that. And then going back to the college thing is a degree doesn't matter. And that's, and that again, also a cliche, but whether you actually get the degree or not, it's a matter of, um, besides of course, specialty stuff. It, it's when you, when you get down to it, it's, it's, uh, it's where you want to be and finding a way to get there and not 
necessarily having to pay for a piece of paper that tells you where you're going to get. Yeah. So that's something I've learned. And that's, it's, I've, I think I've sort of exhibited that by, you know, going through the accounting track and then basically ending up every which way, except for accounting when all of a sudden done. All right. And last but not least, where can people connect with you across social media and or poker go? Uh, Samson Simmons is my handle across most things. I have an Instagram. Um, my Twitter handle is uh, Samson Simmons, S-A-M-P-S-O-N-S-I-M-M-O-N-S. Uh, feel free to catch me there. I don't tweet a lot, but I post a lot of Poker Central stuff. And at the end of the day, for, for personally, Poker Go and otherwise, I think the, the biggest thing that I value from the audience, from our fans, viewers, subscribers is feedback. So whether it be to myself, to the corporate channels or whatever it may be, Feel free to tweet at me, ask me any questions along the way about our content, programming, suggestions, whatever it may be. And I'm happy to hear it. At the end of the day, I, I come into the office every day for our subscribers and users, and uh, that's who my boss is. Boom. There you go. It's <laughs> all of our bosses, right? That's right. <laughs> yes, sir. Consumer. It's all right. <laughs> Sam Simmons, the president of Poker Central, got his hands in a lot of other things. You know, I'm excited that you were able to take this time to do this. I look forward to working more and more with you over the next few years. And, and thanks for coming on to share some of this career insight and no doubt in my mind, and I'm sure the mind of Sean and our viewers that uh, Poker Go, Poker Central is just going to continue the evolution of poker entertainment. So that's right. Best time, yet to come. Man. Poker Central, <laughs> the golf channel. Okay. There you, there, go. there you go. Yeah. That's high quality content by the poker boss. <laughs> Thank you, Sam. Appreciate it, man. Thank you guys. Appreciate you having me. For sure. Right. See you, buddy. All right, Poker Boss. I enjoyed that, man. I really enjoyed getting to know Sam more. I enjoyed getting to know his career story. I love the vision for Poker Central and Poker Go. You know, you work with Sam. You work with that team, right? You know, as part of the ARIA Poker Partnership. What did you think? You know, Sam is obviously a very intelligent person who has a – variety of experience yeah. to propel him in this business, uh, not just from a poker end, but from uh, content creation end, which is a part of the game. He talked about things that he still needs to learn in the business and so on and so forth. And actually, uh, maybe one day I'd like to learn his side of the business, learn about the filming and, uh, you know, creating content and stuff like that. And just working with amazingly talented people like Ali Najad and Brent Hanks and uh, Remco and the entire team over there at uh, Poker Central. They're, uh, they're pretty amazing. But yeah, it was, uh, I actually, I've been working with Sam now for almost five years and I learned some new things. So I hope our viewers get to take a lot from what he said. And, uh, you know, it's really nice to see a guy that has skyrocketed success really quickly at a young age, younger than most people, you know, anytime, even guys like us say, they say we're young for what we do in the game that we do and stuff like that. It's nice to see him be so humbled mm -hmm. down to earth and he gets it. He gets mm -hmm. it. And you mentioned this during uh, his interview, but you, you, you kind of like piggybacked some of the things that we talked about in one of our first podcasts, uh, which was my interview and there were a lot of similarities there talking about how, you know, in poker, you know, there are a lot of people that know a lot about poker, that know a lot about people and stuff like that. Um, but in operations, I always tell people, if you want to be successful in poker, you have to put the people first. Mm -hmm. And I always say my first customer every day when I walk into work is my employees, mm -hmm. is my team. They are my first customer. Because if people can see that they're being engaged, that they're happy, that they want to come to work, that makes them want to come to play. And then we take care of the guests, you know, especially at a place like Aria, we always say when they come in the door, 99.9% .9 of people, when they come to Aria, they know the game of poker. Mm -hmm. They're not, we don't teach them poker. We're not in the poker business. We're in the guest experience business. We want to make sure when they walk through the door that they have a smiling face. And when they walk out, they know that they want to return whether they won, lost, or, or, or broke even in the game, we want to make sure that they say next time, I want to go back to Aria. So, you know, it was really, it was really cool to see that interview and, and, and see another person in the industry that kind of gets it, but realizes that we all continue to keep learning.
Oh, hundred percent, man. I loved it too. And I think that whether you're, you know, 30 years in your career or two years in your career, you're going to get some really cool bits of information from our time with Sam. So Sam, thanks for taking time to do that. No doubt that uh, your career will continue to excel as will the growth of the business of Poker Central, Poker Go, and, you know, shout out to the entire Poker Central team. It's a passionate group of people that's really trying to move, you know, poker entertainment forward. You know, I think everybody would agree on that. So, hey, great things in store for the Faded Spade podcast uh, over the next few weeks. You know, the first season we had, I would say, a lot of players who own their own businesses on to share their entrepreneurial stories. We're still going to do that this season too, but we're going to mix in more of the kind of career industry leader perspective interviews as well because we're hearing that people want more and more of that as well so we'll still have a balance but going to bring on a few more industry leaders compared to players that run businesses this season as well but we'll keep that balance and it's all to to really inspire and to engage those who are on these similar career journeys or entrepreneurial journeys and overall like we talk about it's to show a side of our great poker industry that not many people know exists right so are you ready for season two of the Faded Spade podcast, Sean? Yes, sir. Let's do it. Actually, quick shout out and a, a way we can close this first show off. Do you have your glass on you? I do have my glass. It's, it's empty, but I do have my glass. It's but but it's okay. You can see the contrast. You can, a yeah. shout out to Alexa who brought these in. Um, I believe she's from St. Louis area. Don't quote me on that one. Um, and I know she, she, does, she did these herself. Like she makes glasses and blow, blown glass and stuff like that, which is super cool. I do not have a artistic slash talented bone like this in my body. So I always thought that was pretty cool. So a fan out there, we should drop. Anytime Absolutely. someone's going to make us personalized glasses. Absolutely. Get That's funny because we didn't actually play in a drink out of these today at the same time. So well, that's none out. of my business. <laughs> Water and ice. Thank you. So I don't know what's in yours, but anyway, <laughs> that's right. Shout out to our, our fans, the, the, the viewers and listeners of the podcast. We continue to grow because you guys are, are interested in hearing what our guests have to say. And you know, maybe interested in what we have to say too sometimes, Sean. So signing off, Faded Spade podcast. I think it's episode 11 or 12, but the first of season two. Hope you enjoyed our time with us and our special guest, Sam Simmons, president of Poker Center. The Faded Spade Podcast is sponsored by Duck Duck Productions. Contact them for all of your podcast editing needs at randy at duckduckpro.com. Upgrade to Faded Spade and get 15% off the new face of cards with code podcast at fadedspade.com. <laughs>